Welcome back to my channel, guys. My name is Prince Cloudy, and this is True Crime and Chill. Welcome. Hi. If you are new here, this is True Crime and Chill, where I come to tell you guys about some of the most shocking cases that took place in South Africa. Some are well known, some are not so well known. So if you want to keep hearing more about it and you want to keep on chilling with me, why don't you go ahead and support my channel by just clicking that subscribe button and pressing that like button as well and commenting down on the video what you think about the video what you think about the case do you think that there's something else that could have been done do you think there's more to it than meets the eye do you think i don't know do you think the the person who did this deserves to get more than they got look whatever thought you may have i want you to put it down below and tell me what you think because i would love to keep hearing from you okay i would love to keep on getting your support and it means the world to me. So if you are new here, go ahead and be part of our little group. And let's just talk all about these things. Let's just break them down and talk about them. So the case that I have for you today is also a very, a very nasty case. It's also a very horrific case. Um, it's very well known and it was well covered in the media as well. And it took place between these uh, things that I'm going to talk about. They took place between 2012 and 2016. So, yeah, it was quite a long time ago, but the people still think about them to this day. So I thought I might as well talk about it as well with you guys. So sit back, relax, and let me tell you all about the Krugersdorp murders. So this is the case of Cecilia Stain. And if you don't know who that is, well, all I can say is she was a, she was quite a character. She was a messed up person if i had to say so myself but you know what i'll give out my opinion on this case at the end of it because right now i just i'm just speechless at the things that i read and the the information that i found but this case has a lot of information to it it's got a lot of a lot of sources saying different things but i'm just going to try to just give you a brief summary of what happens of what happened in this case so cecilia was born in 1980 in harrismith and i couldn't really find a lot of information on her childhood i couldn't find out a lot of things about her as a child but it was said that she had her own fair share of getting in trouble as a matter of fact she ended up getting suspended in school once for drinking and it was said that she had a very toxic and competitive behavior she had a very toxic competitive behavior so I don't know how you might want to take that, but you can take it as you will. That's, you know, just as much as I could find out about how she was as a child, all right? But according to her, she said that she had a very traumatic and abusive childhood, and she had a tough and abusive father, and she suffered a lot of physical and sexual abuse at the hands of her close family members. But her own mother called these claims of hers to be lies, she said that Cecilia had a habit of making up stories. So I don't know what we should believe in this case, whether she really did have an, an abusive and traumatic childhood or if she was just making this up. But she said that she had a very traumatic and a very abusive childhood. At the age of 15, Cecilia dropped out of school. And then a year later, when she was 16, she met a man who would later become her husband. His name is Andres Stain. And Andres also dropped out of school to become a police officer, which is very funny to think about, seeing as how his wife became what she became. But yeah, he was a police officer, and they were married for 15 years. But their marriage was not as pitch perfect as you would assume it to be. As a matter of fact, they had separate lives, and Andres ended up obtaining custody of their kids, full custody of their kids. So together they had two kids, a son who was 12 years old at the time and a daughter who was 16 years old at the time. And it was said that this case affected them in a very negative way. It took its toll on them. Um, it was said that the son became very angry and aggressive when his mother got arrested. And, you know, their academics also took a negative turn. The son no longer participated in a lot of sports that he enjoyed, so it changed them a bit because they were not even allowed to see their mother. They were not even allowed to have contact sessions with her in prison. They could only see her through glass panels of the prison. So understandably, I mean, 
it had to take its own toll on the kids, and that's exactly what it did. It was also said that Andres believed that his wife was framed of these crimes that we're going to talk about in the case, um, because he had described her to be a wonderful friend and a wonderful mother to their children. So he believed that she was innocent and she was simply framed. And I think at the, at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about how I think he may have gotten to that conclusion of her being framed. But maybe you might even get it. You might even catch it at, like during the video. But I'll tell you exactly why I think he thought that she was innocent. But yeah, so this man was clearly saying that, look, a person like this could never be capable of doing anything like this. But you and I both know, we both know that looks can be deceiving. Oh yeah, we do. But now let's get into the case. Let's talk about what really happened here. Let's talk about these murders that took place because there's a lot of them. So, and there's a lot of people involved in this case. I'm going to be throwing out a lot of names at you, but if you follow me, if you pay attention, you're going to get it, okay? You're going to, you're going to get what's happening here, so stay with me, okay? It all started in 2012, when Cecilia started attending this church called the Overcomers Through Christ, but we're going to call it the OTC for short. And it was led by a woman who was known as Rhea Grunwald. And when Cecilia started attending this church, she attended saying that she needed deliverance from Satanism and that she was running away from this satanic church because some sources say that she was a, she claimed that she was a 42nd generational witch and this satanic church was after her soul. They wanted to take her and so she needed the help of the OTC to keep praying for her, to deliver her from Satanism and this satanic church and to protect her soul. And of course, when Rhea heard about this, she said, you know what, it's fine. We will pray for you. We'll help you out. We'll protect you. We'll protect you through prayer. And we'll make sure that this satanic church doesn't claim your soul. So yeah, Rhea and her church believed Cecilia's story about this Satanism and satanic church thing. And they ended up praying for her. They ended up doing it a lot, constantly. And to make sure that her story actually sticks, Cecilia ended up putting up a bit of a performance by coughing out blood, claiming that it was a demonic attack from the satanic church that she was running away from. And so this was really cementing Rhea and the church's belief in what she was saying. While at this church, Cecilia was also with a woman by the name of Marinda Stain, but they are not related. They just share a surname, but they're not related. But some sources say that they met a long time before they before they met at the church again. Some sources say they met in 2007 and then they started their friendship throughout the years until they got to this church, um, the OTC. But they were at this church together and at this church, they uh, grew their friendship and their friendship led to some of the most horrific things that they could have ever done. It was a very dangerous, a very toxic friendship, but they were close friends in this church. Remember how I said that Cecilia and Rhea Grunwald had their own relationship? Well, it didn't take long for that relationship to go south because in 2012, Rhea found out that Cecilia was lying to her. Cecilia was lying about the whole satanic church being after her, about the whole um, Satanism thing and demonic attacks. And when she found out that Cecilia had been lying to her and her church, of course, she cut her off and she kicked out of her church. And Cecilia wasn't happy about it. She was pretty pissed about it. So much so that she swore to take her own revenge on Rhea and her church. So the falling out of their relationship began a chain of events of some of the most gruesome and nasty things you could ever think of, okay? Um, and this happened because, like I said, Cecilia claimed that, you know what, I'm going to have my revenge on you. I'm going to take my revenge on you. And when she said this, remember I told you that she had a very competitive nature. She was known for being very competitive. She ended up starting her own church as well, start, starting her own group. And they called themselves the Electors Produce. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. But when it's translated, it just means chosen by God. And the people that joined her in this group of hers and, and ended up becoming her accomplices as well in the crimes that they were going to commit were a man named Zach Valentine and his wife Michaela Valentine and as well her friend Marinda Stain and her two kids 
um, Marcel Stain as well as LaRue Stain. And they also ended up getting a man by the name of John Bernard to join their group. But we'll talk more about John Bernard later in the video, okay? But yeah, this was now their group. The original members were just Cecilia, Marinda, and Zach. So now that Cecilia opened up her new church, her church had one mission and one mission only, to destroy the OTC, to take them down, to take down Rhea and anyone associated with her, and to just bring them down to their knees. So, and they did this by a series of attacks at the OTC members as well as Rhea. They took it so far that on July 2nd of 2012, they planted explosives under the cars of the OTC members, hoping that they could just kill them or maybe injure them. But luckily, as they were planning to put in these explosives, they almost got caught and they couldn't really set them to explode. So they left and they ran before the explosives could be set to, to explode, which is very good to think about, which is very good if you think about it. Because imagine the loss of lives that would have happened that day if they had really set off those explosives because they were they were hell bent on taking down the OTC and their members and anyone associated with the OTC. However, almost getting caught didn't stop them at all. No, 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 it didn't. As a matter of fact, they went on to set a fire at a Christian center known as the Lighthouse Christian Center. And I'm guessing Rhea had some sort of connection to it because at the gate of the center, Cecilia left a note for Rhea saying, quote, Rhea, who's going to protect you now? End quote. So yeah, you can tell that um, Cecilia was really hell-bent on getting her revenge for being kicked out of the church, for being, you know, shunned out by Rhea as well. So yep, they did that. They seriously did that. And it was kind of messed up, you know? Remember their plot to set off explosives that didn't work at first? Well, they went back to that plan and this time it actually worked because on the 11th of July in 2012, they managed to blow up a couple of cars at the OTC because it was said that at that time the, there was a meeting of the church and so they thought, you know what, these cars must be the cars of the members of the church, so let's just blow them up. And they did set up explosives near the cars and they managed to blow them up. But I couldn't get any information on whether there was any lives that were lost, but I really, really hope not. But yeah, this time their plan worked. So now you can tell that Cecilia was really getting obsessed with taking down Rhea and her church and anyone associated with the OTC. And it got so bad that on the 26th of July in 2012, they planned their first murder. And they were going to kill a woman by the name of Natasha Berger. And Natasha was an active member of the OTC. She was well known in the church. So they thought, you know what? She has to go. And Cecilia convinced Zach Valentine and his wife, Michaela Valentine, to be the ones who carry out this murder plan. And so they devised a plan. And the plan was they were going to break into the house of um, Natasha's close friend, Joy Bonzea, and they were going to force her to write a message to, to Natasha, asking her to come see her at her flat in Veda Park when she got back from work. And it actually worked. It actually worked because Natasha did go to Joy's flat to go see her, thinking that it was really a genuine message from her asking her to come see her. When she arrived, they brutally attacked her and they stabbed her to death. And they also killed Joy as well. I'm guessing they were saying no witnesses. So yeah, the first murder was, was not complete. It was really sick. So now that it seemed like they had their ball rolling on their mission to take down the OTC, now they had their eyes set on their next target. And this target was a man and a close friend to Rhea, a man by the name of John Edwin Ben Dixon. And he was also a well-known member of the church because he gave lectures at the church occasionally. And he was a semi-retired pastor. So yeah, Rhea considered her as a mentor and a very close friend. And because of this, unfortunately, he became a target to Cecilia and her group. And they carried out a plan to take him out. And the plan was on the 13th of August in 2012, Zach and Marinda were going to disguise themselves as police officers and they were going to go to John's house and they actually carried out the plan and when they got into his house they attacked him with a hand axe and they attacked him so bad and they stabbed him so many times 
that he ended up dying from his injuries as well. So now people that were closely associated to Rhea, people that had anything to do with the OTC were targets of these of this group known as the Electors Produce that Cecilia had come up with. Get this, get this. This was so disturbing to read. Um, when Marinda was, dis was, was describing her first murder, her first kill, she said that it felt exciting and it was an adrenaline rush. So you can tell that these people were not remorseful at all for what they did to John, for what they did to Natasha and Joy. They were not remorseful at all. They just did what they did because, hey, it was exciting and it was an adrenaline rush. So these people were really sick. So remember Zach's wife, Michaela? Well, now at this point, Michaela was starting to open her eyes and she was starting to think that, okay, maybe this is not such a good idea. Maybe being in this group is, is a bit messed up. And she started talking about wanting to, to leave the group. And I'm guessing this got them worried because now they had killed three people, right? And she knew about it. So maybe they thought that she was going to end up reporting them to the police. And of course, Cecilia wasn't going to have that. So she was like, okay. Zach, your wife has to go. Your wife has got to go. And you would think that Zach would actually defend his wife and say, no, she's not going to say anything. I'll make sure of it. We don't have to kill her. Just let her leave. No, no. Zach ended up agreeing. He got convinced that his wife had to be killed. As a matter of fact, he had a hand in it because the murder of, of his wife was planned to take place on October 4th of 2012. And the plan was... Zach was going to put in a tranquilizer in a coffee in the morning before he left for work. And he wanted to have a solid alibi to make sure that he's not connected to her murder whatsoever. Because we all know that when, when a woman dies or when a, when a husband dies or when a wife dies, the first person they look at, the first person the police investigate is the spouse. So he wanted to create a solid alibi for himself. But before he left for work on that morning of October 4th in 2012, he made sure to put in a tranquilizer in Michaela's coffee so that it can stop her from putting up any much of a fight when her murder took place. And that happened. And after that happened, he gave a set of keys to Marinda so she can use them to access the gate and to get into the house as well. And just when you thought this couldn't get any worse, just when you thought... It couldn't get any more disturbing. Marinda took her 14-year-old daughter and went with her to Michaela and Zach's house to help her kill Michaela. So now she involved her 14-year-old daughter, Mar Marcel, in this. So now that's how Marcel got into it. And it was so heartbreaking to learn that anyone would take their 14-year-old daughter to do something like this. So yeah, um, it was said that she went with M Marcel to Michaela and Zach's house and they found Michaela sleeping because remember, Zach put in a tranquilizer in her coffee to, um, to knock her out. So they found her sleeping when, and when they found her, it was said that they hit her with a blunt object. They, they, they crushed her skull with a blunt object and they stabbed her as well multiple times as she was lying in her bed and unfortunately Michaela lost her life. I'm guessing they considered Michaela to be a liability to their group and now that the liability was out of the way their next target was Rhea Grunewald's son Joshua Grunewald. So Cecilia had hired a couple of guys to go kill Rhea's son but it was said that they never carried out this plan to kill him so luckily he survived the whole thing luckily he didn't get killed he didn't get hurt as well but he was the next target and i'm guessing that cecilia didn't follow up on this because it was never mentioned that he ended up getting killed at a later stage so that's very fortunate that those guys that she hired didn't get, didn't go through with it so now this plan this vengeful plan of cecilia to take out the otc and everyone associated with it was coming together right but what I found funny was that the person that they wanted to kill the most, the person that they wanted to take out the most, was still alive. She survived the whole thing. She didn't get hurt. As a matter of fact, Rhea ended up testifying against Cecilia in court. But when she was testifying, she was very, very emotionally destroyed. So much so that she said that the Rhea Grunewald, 
that she was before this whole thing happened was dead. She was no longer herself. She lost everything. And it got so bad that her own family turned their backs on her because they believed that she had something to do with this um, because these things kept on happening all around her. So she lost everything and she was so broken down by all of this. She was so broken down by everything that Cecilia had done because Cecilia destroyed her entire world. She may not have gotten to kill her, but she definitely destroyed her life. But now let's go back to Cecilia and her group, the Electors Produce. What a crazy ass name. So yeah, now that they had done all these things, they wanted to lay low for a while, especially after killing Zach's wife, Michaela. They wanted to lay low for a while and they did this. But as they were doing this, they were running out of money, all right? Things were getting tight now. They needed to make some money. And at this time, Zach had already put in his own money of 2 million rands into this group. So I wonder what really happened to all of it. But it was said that they were starting to run out of money. And now they started coming up with plans to make money because Zach had quit his job at this time and he wanted to start his own hustle aside. And he kept on borrowing money from his family and his in-laws and I'm guessing his in-laws or anyone else for that matter couldn't really put it together that he had something to do with this because if he was still keeping contact with his in-laws then it means that they had no idea so the group had to find a way to make some money right and they came up with a couple of plans and of course these were not good plans so you may be wondering how they started making money. You may be wondering what they what, what they planned, you know, to make sure that they made some money. Well, let me tell you, um, Cecilia had them believing that she was running this orphanage. She had an orphanage that she was running and the orphanage needed money. So they had to do something. They had to commit a series of crimes for them to raise money for the orphanage. And they committed crimes like insurance fraud, murder as well as theft so that's how they got to get some of the money that we're going to talk about that they got before they got caught you want to know how sick and twisted these people were well let me tell you they believed that they were committing these crimes in good faith they believed that they were doing this for a good cause and they were doing it to do the lord's work so yeah that's how delusional they were that's how that's how all of them fell for Cecilia's crap. She made them believe that all of this was for a good cause and it was in good faith. So now that they had to start making plans to get more money, they had their first target in mind and his name was Peter Mayer. And Peter was the boss of John Bernard. If you still remember John Bernard, I mentioned him earlier in the video and I said that we're gonna talk more about him later. Well, he was the employee of Peter Mayer and he ended up helping Cecilia and his group with trying to rob this man and his wife because the plan was John set up a meeting between, between Peter Mayer and, and Cecilia and her group and he convinced Peter to let them meet at his house for a business discussion and Peter agreed and when the group got to his house, they then robbed him and his wife at gunpoint. But when they found out that they didn't have much money, they ended up stabbing the couple to death and they took whatever they could take and they just left them there. So now the group had some money, right? They had money, but it wasn't much money. So they had to make another plan to get even more money. And now they came up with this crazy plan to fake Zach's death so that they can get an insurance payout on his life insurance. And they went through with it. They really went through with it. And it was said that the insurance payout was going to be 3.5 million rands. So yeah, it was a lot of money and they couldn't just leave it like that. So they decided to create this perfect plan to fake Zach's death so they can claim his insurance money. So when they set their plan in motion, they decided to form a friendship with a street vendor by the name of um, Jared Jackson. And they did this so that they can use him to carry out this plan of theirs to fake Zach's death. And Jared had no idea. He had no idea what was coming his way because 
on the 16th of December in 2015, Marinda, her son LaRue, and Bernard, as well as Jackson, they took two cars and drove to the Free State. So I think you can already tell where this is going to go. So on the way, they carried out their plan to fake Zach's death. And what happened was LaRue drugged Jared Jackson and strangled him. And when he got strangled and after strangling him, um, they then put him in the driver's seat of Zach's car because one of the two cars that they took was Zach's car. So they put him in the driver's seat of Zach's car. And what they did was they set it on fire with Jared Jackson still in the car. So this is how they were going to fake they were going to fake Zach's death. They were going to identify his body as Zach and they were going to make sure that they get a death certificate so that they can get um, an insurance payout on his life. So yeah, that was their plan and sadly someone horrifically died for it. Jared died not knowing what was going to happen to him that day. He thought that he was just going out with friends, but they drugged him, strangled him, and then they set him on fire inside Zach's car to make it look like it was Zach who died in that car. I'm guessing their plan worked because on the next day, Marinda ended up identifying the burnt body of Jared Jackson as the body of Zach Valentine. And she ended up getting a death certificate and she presented it to the insurance company. And I think they ended up getting the payout. And now Zach was waiting for his payday at a hotel in in um, Krugersdorp and he he registered into the hotel under a fake name of Jock de Villiers and he was just waiting for his payday. So even after getting all this money, you would think that they were done. You would think that they say, okay, now we have millions. We don't need any more money. You would think that they're done, but no, no, they're not. Because now they started planning more murders. And this time they wanted to be more calculating with their murders. They started planning fake appointments with their victims. And what they would do is when this person comes to wherever they call them to, they would then force them at gunpoint to give them their ATM cards and to give them their PIN numbers. And then um, Marcel and yeah, Marcel would go to the ATM to go confirm if the pins are correct. And if they are correct, they would sadly strangle their victims or either stab them to death. So this was now their new plan. Murders by fake appointments. So their first victim of these murders by appointment was a man by the name of Glenn McGregor, who was a tax consultant from Ranfontaine. And the plan was... Um, they were going to get Marinda, Bernard, and LaRue to go to his house. And when they got to his house, they shot him, and then they forced him to transfer 6,000 Rand into Marinda's account. And after he did this, they killed him. They left him there to die from his gunshot wounds. So their plan to kill um, Glenn McGregor happened in December of 2015. And then in May of 2016, they set their eyes on their second target, a man by the name of Anthony Schofield, who was also a tax collect, a tax consultant. But some sources say that he was a financial broker. But yeah, he was 67 years old at the time. And what they did was they forced him at gunpoint as well to give up his ATM cards and PIN numbers. And they went on to withdraw 16,000 Rand from his bank cards. And then they went on to spend on various shops. They went to use his ATM cards in various shops and they strangled him and then they left him in the boot of his car and they abandoned his car for anyone to find. After this, they came across a 29 year old man by the name of Kevin McAlphin and they did the same thing to him as well. They got him to go to their flat on May 26th of 2016 in Krugersdorp and when he got there, they also did the same thing to him. They took his cards, his pin numbers, and then they strangled him and they killed him. And just like um, just like Anthony, they put him in the boot of his car and they left him there as well. And they just kept on doing this thing for a long time. A few days later, after killing Kevin McAlphin, on the 30th of May in 2016, they set their eyes on their final target, a woman by the name of Han Lee Leitgon. And she was an estate agent. 
So they had her believing that she was meeting up with a client in Krugersdorp. And when she got there, they did the same thing to her as well. They strangled her um, after taking her cards and her, her and her ATM pin numbers, and they killed her. And what happened was this time they put her in Marinda's car so that they can dump her body somewhere near Ranfontein. But she was found on the next day because she was reported missing in that area. So the police found her on the next day and they ruled her death to be death by strangulation. It was said that between 2012 and 2016, Cecilia and her group had killed 11 people. And their final victim was Han Lee Leipgon that I just spoke about right now. Because a few weeks after her death, a few, just a few weeks after her death, um, LaRue and his sister Marcel were caught by the police. They were arrested and after a lengthy interrogation session, they ended up giving up the name of Cecilia, of their mother Marinda, and the name of Bernard as well. So, and also Zach's name. So finally, these people were going to get arrested because LaRue and Marcel ended up, ended up admitting to a lot of these crimes that they did. They told them in detail what they did to their victims. And after giving up the names of Cecilia, Marinda, and Bernard, as well as Zach, they all were finally arrested. On the 19th of October in 2019, um, the trial of the original members of the Electors Produce group, Cecilia, Zach, and Marinda, started. Right, So their trial began on the 19th of October in 2019. And when this happened, they were found guilty and they were sentenced to multiple life sentences in prison. And a year after the sentencing, Marinda did plead guilty to her part in all of these crimes. And she was given a sentence of 115 years in prison. Since Marcel was only 14 when she committed her first crime, remember when she helped her mother kill Zach's wife, Michaela? Since she was only 14 at the time, her minimum sentence was moved. So I'm guessing they wanted to wait and try her as an adult when she was finally um, at the right age. But her sentencing was, was moved. But her brother, um, LaRue, LaRue Stain, was sentenced to 35 years in prison because it was said that he committed seven of the murders. He pleaded guilty to seven of the murders, but he took out a plea bargain by saying that he will testify against Cecilia and the rest of their group. And he took the plea bargain, and because of this, 10 years was taken off his sentence. So Bernard's verdict, John Bernard's verdict, was given in 2016, and he was also found guilty for the part that he played in all of this, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So yeah, justice was finally served, and these people's reign of terror the killing spree in Krugersdorp had finally come to an end. But it was said that their motives were simply greed, revenge, religious extremism, and simple manipulation. And the judge who was working on this case, Judge Jacob Francis, said that this was the worst case he had ever worked on in his years of experience. He couldn't imagine anyone doing anything like this just for money and revenge and for greed as well and he went on to say that um, the group should have called itself elected by lucifer because there was nothing godly about what they did there was nothing that justified what they did they were not doing it for a good cause they were just cold-hearted murderers so to this day the group is still serving their sentences in prison and they will be there for a very long time so yeah guys that's the case of the krugersdorp killers some call it the krugersdorp cult killings so i don't know do you think they were a cult just let me know but they did follow every single order that cecilia gave out and which brings me to the point of um, what i think of the case i think that okay first it was pretty messed up obviously and what I think is that it was really smart of Cecilia to just keep on ordering these people to kill. Because if you really think about it, I didn't mention anywhere that Cecilia was the one who pointed the gun or who shot someone or who stabbed someone. It was always Zach 
Marinda and the others. They were all just taking orders from her. They were all just doing whatever she said. So it was really smart of her. Maybe she thought that she wasn't going to get um, connected to these crimes in any way if she didn't do the killing. So, yeah, and I'm thinking this is why her husband thought that she was framed. Because, hey, she didn't do the killing. She didn't kill anyone. It was Zach. It was Marinda. It was Bernard. It was LaRue. It was Marcel. So maybe that's why Andres thought that Cecilia was innocent. So yeah, that is the case of the Kruger's Dope killings, guys. And what I think about this case is that, um, well, it was very tragic. And my heart goes out to the family members of the victims, to the friends of the victims as well. This is something that... This is something that should never happen to anyone. No one deserves any of this for money, for greed, to have their lives taken for greed. But the fact that Cecilia ordered these people to keep doing this, I think she was very cunning. She was a very cunning and calculative person. And maybe she thought that if she didn't do the killings herself, she wasn't going to be associated with this if she ever got caught. So yeah, guys, that's the case that I had for you guys today. And remember, if you enjoyed it, please press the like button, um, support my channel by subscribing if you are new. I would love to keep on having you here. And I will be back again with another episode later this week. And yeah, like I said, my name is Prince Gladi and this was True Crime and Chill. Have a great week.